Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our virtual Life After Kings English and Writing event. Although we are, uh, we are presenting this event virtually today, I would like to start by acknowledging that King's University College is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and the Chinooktun people, all of whom have long longstanding relationships to the land of southwestern Ontario and the Sorry. city of London. Um, I'm just going to make sure everyone's muted, then we go out. Uh, the First Nations communities of our local area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation. In our region, there are 11 First Nation communities, as well as a growing Indigenous urban population. King's University College values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, also known as North America. My name is Laura Peters, and I'm from the alumni office here at King. Also joining us today is Professor Paul Wurstein, which you all know because you're mostly in the room with him. Um, this event is run in partnership between the Office of Alumni and Development and the English Department. So our goal is to give students an idea of the types of careers that our alumni have and how they got there. So as our panelists are speaking, you might um, come up with some questions. Uh, so hold at the end, we will save some time um, to open the floor to those questions. And now I'd like to introduce our guests that we have today. So Josephine Bondi. Um, after a career teaching elementary school, Josephine began pursuing writing studies as a part-time special student at Western's main campus. Graduating with a diploma in writing in 2018 did not stop her from continuing to take one writing course after another. In the fall of 2018, King's offered a brand new writing course, Writing 2301, Tutoring Writers. That was the first of several King's writing courses that Josephine took, eventually accumulating enough courses to qualify for the King's Certificate in the Teaching and Practice of Writing. She graduated from King's with this certificate in June of 2021. For the past three years, Josephine has served as editor of the MEM Insider, a publication of King's School of Management, Economics, and Mathematics. She has worked as a writing tutor at the King's Writing Center, The Right Place, since 2019, and she is planning to pursue graduate studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education beginning this September. So welcome, Josephine. Uh, we have Dr. Noni Brennan. Noni graduated from King's in English Language and Literature in 84. Her career has been dedicated to positive, positive community outcomes with a focus on ending homelessness. Her roles have included executive director of a volunteer center, executive director of the Emergency Fund, and CEO of All Chicago Making Homelessness History. She holds a Doctor of Management and a Master's in Public Service. She has received recognition for her visionary leadership through a special tribute from Michigan's governor and the Alumni Distinction Award from King's University College. In 2017, she received an honorary Doctor of Laws from Western. She was elected to the King's University College Board of Directors in 2019 and is currently a member of the King's Alumni Board. Noni enjoys cooking, reading, traveling, and life at her cottage in Bayfield with her husband and her two community-minded daughters, and her dog, Edgar. And she owns the Village Bookshop in Bayfield. We have Merrick Kubo. Merrick is currently a manager in corporate communications and public relations at London Health Sciences Centre. He is also chair of the board of directors at the London Cross-Cultural Learner Centre and is a former president of the London chapter of the International Association of Business Communicators. Merrick has a Bachelor of Arts English Language and Literature Honors Specialization from King's, as well as a postgraduate public relations certificate from Humber College and a postgraduate project management certificate uh, from Fanshawe College. Merrick is an avid Manchester United supporter and enjoys reading fantasy literature and graphic novels when he can pull away from Twitter, Reddit, and news media. And last but not least, we have Melanie Sibbert. Melanie was born and raised in the very small town of Rodney, which is west of London. She is the first and only person in her family to attend university. She did a BA honors degree in English and history at King's and then completed her Bachelor of Education at Alt House College. She's been teaching at her old high school since 2000 and has worked with some of her former teachers. She's also taught art, French and drama, and she's been the teacher librarian for over 15 years. She's an avid reader and she loves to travel. 
both of which she's been able to do as part of her job. So again, welcome everyone. We really appreciate uh, you giving us your time today. And we'll get into our, our first question here. And Josephine, since you're the most recent grad, we'll, we'll let you start the first one off. Um, so tell us a bit about your time at King. So your classes, were you involved in any extracurricular activities? Did you have a favorite professor? Okay, sorry, it took me a second to unmute there. <laughs> um, well, the first thing to realize about me is my situation's a little different than everyone else here. It's a little unique. Um, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time at King's because I've not done my uh, full degree here. Uh, I did my full degree many years ago um, at Carleton University in Ottawa. So that's when I, I was a, an English major at that time. Uh, but I, I want to say that my time at King's has been a game changer for me. At King's, I have felt more appreciated and more valued than almost anywhere else I can think of. Uh, King's is a place where I feel I have been truly seen. And that fact of being seen for, for my strengths has inspired me with confidence and a belief in myself that I had been lacking. Believe it or not, at my age, uh, I had been lacking that. Um, and the faculty member who has impacted me the most is Dr. Vidya Natarajan. Her present position in the Department of English, French and Writing is assistant professor and assistant coordinator writing. But when I first attended King's as her student, she was the coordinator of King's Writing Center. That's the right place. Through Dr. Natarajan, my interest in writing center work evolved to the point where I know that is where I belong in terms of my career. And I plan to pursue, um, as you said, graduate studies with the goal of working full-time in a position of responsibility in uh, a post-writing, or sorry, post-secondary writing center somewhere. Um, yeah. So that was that, and, and really I can't, when I talk about, about Kings, I can't talk in the past because as you, uh, in your introduction made clear, I'm really still, uh, 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 I st I'm still a part of Kings. It's just a part-time position, um, but I can't talk about my experience in the past tense because really I'm still here. That's great. We love when people stay in the, in the Kings community. So that's wonderful. Um, Merrick, how about yourself? So I studied English language and literature, uh, like all of you. Um, but I began with a minor in political science. And when I was at King's, uh, they introduced the honor specialization courses, which I'm going to presume you guys still have, but it was basically adding extra English courses. So I dropped the minor and I went all in on uh, the content that I loved um, and got to experience a wider array of literature. Um, so my favorite professor was Dr. DeChico, who I think now is Professor Emeritus with King's. Um, and it was really her American literature courses that inspired me then and actually continue to inspire me. I absolutely love American literature to this day. Um, other notables would be Dr. Paul Wurstein, who's uh, with us in the room. And I always get a kick of seeing his name when I go to Stratford. If you go into the gift shops, a lot of the books have been edited by him. Um, so that's fantastic. And one I wish I paid more attention to as I got older was uh, Dr. Orange and his Canadian literature course. Um, at the time, I wasn't that into it, but have enjoyed it much more. Um, while at King's, I didn't participate in any King's clubs. I did participate with the Outdoors Club at Western, spent a good deal of time at the Spoke. And also um, in my fourth year, I started branching out to some seminar courses that were available at Huron and at Western on its main campus as well. Great, thank you. And Melanie, how about yourself? What was your time at Queens like, or Kings like? Um, well, it's been over 20 years ago now. Um, I did a double major English and history because um, basically when I looked at the course calendar, that's only the courses I wanted to take. Um, I did take a couple of French courses as well, but it was mostly English and history. A favorite English profs were Dr. Paul Werstein, um, Dr. Patterson, and Dr. Patton, and of course, Dr. Dutigo. Uh, she was feisty. I liked her. Um, 
at King's, I was in the JMS Careless History Club for a few years, but then I went to Maine and was playing in the Western Medieval Society for most of my undergrad, um, where I got to do all kinds of cool medieval things. Um, I also worked at the library, so the brand new, back when the Carter Library was brand new, I could work there for a year. Um, and that's kind of where it started, where I, hey, this is a great place to be. After that, I ended up working at Huron for a couple of years. And when I was at Teachers College, I worked at Weldon. So I got to see all the libraries. I still like the Kings one. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, like I said, I took mostly English and history courses. I remember being in Dr. Werstein's class and he had his grad student come in. And because I could offer some history background, he, he thought that was really awesome for a student. I remember that. That was a good memory. Sorry. Good. Thank you. And Noni, how about yourself? Sorry. Well, I went I went to King's because I actually grew up down the street from King's. And so it was easy, an easy commute for me. And um, I didn't have far to go. But when I was at King's, I had one goal. And my goal was to graduate. And at the time, I wasn't thinking as much about what I what courses I should be taking to be able to get a job. I was just thinking about what are the courses that I really enjoy? And for me, it was history and English. And so those were the courses that I focused on and that's what I took. Luckily for me at the time, you didn't have to take a science or a math to, to graduate. If you did, I'd probably still be there, but um, I did not participate a lot in sort of um, clubs or social groups because I was a busy volunteer. So I was very focused on the community and was involved in a lot of volunteer uh, work in different organizations in the community, which was really helpful for me when I went to get a job after I graduated. Um, there are two professors in the English department who I really loved, and I think I took every course they taught, and it was Professor Orange and Professor Patterson. Great, thank you. Um, and Merrick, we'll start with you for this next question. Um, just tell us a little bit about where you are right now in your career. Um, what led you there? Did the, your program um, in English influence your career choices? Did you do any additional schooling? And I think that you all did. And has this current position always been your goal? So my profession is public relations. Um, as soon as my time at King's ended, I did apply for a postgraduate certificate at Humber College in PR. Um, however, Western Continuing Studies has a good program, as does Fanshawe College in London. So you do have options um, locally if that's something you're interested in. Um, so I'm manager of our team. We're a team of 17 individuals and six people fall under myself. So we have a client counsel team, which works almost as account representatives. We go to different areas of the hospital and help them communicate the great things they're doing. And then we have a creative, creative services team, which includes our photographer, a social media um, expert, a graphic designer. So from my degree, um, what you all do every day um, in your studies is reading and comprehension. So you read texts, you comprehend them, and then you write about them um, and you form arguments. And this is something I do every single day. Our whole team does it. Um, the primary, the first skill you need as a public uh, relations communicator is writing, 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 writing. Um, and before that I was doing, I was a media relations consultant um, and then what we do now is everything. We do website content, communication plans, media strategies, uh, social media content, and uh, website development. I think I might have mentioned that. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, and Melanie, how would you um, describe your role right now and how you got there? Okay, I'm a high school teacher. I'm sitting in the art room right now. I'm now teaching art. Um, sitting in the desk that my former art teacher taught in. Um, so yes, I'm teaching at my old high school, um, but I've also been the librarian for 15 years and that kind of weird how I got there. Um, it wasn't direct, but it, I got in through teaching. Um, so yeah, so mostly I've taught English over the past 20 years. I've pretty much taught every English course they have but I've also taught history and drama and now I'm, now I'm the art teacher. So it's, it, 
it seems like, oh yeah, you just go be a teacher and that's the same thing, but my job's changed, I don't know how many times in 20 years. And I still use everything I learned in Kings. Like I'm reading, I'm writing, I'm sharing literature with people and I love pushing books on people. Um, nothing is as good, satisfying as pushing a book on a kid and they like it. So I, I'm a book pusher. <laughs> Um, anything else? Um, I did take AQ courses to get further qualifications after teacher college. I took French um, because frankly, there's always a French job in teaching. Um, I did an AQ in art and I did an AQ in library as well. Um, yeah, so, but I've been teaching at the same school for almost 22 years now. Um, but like I said, constantly changed. Absolutely. And uh, Noni, how about yourself and your career? So um, when I graduated from King's, I don't think I really understood the value of a really good liberal arts education the way I do today, but I did graduate with a really good liberal arts education. And I think what that does is um, provides you with a, a toolkit, tool belt to be able to really move forward in a variety of different ways. And so for me, because I was always interested in the nonprofit world, I started as a fundraiser in London, Ontario at um, Museum London. And I, I think the, 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 what I learned at King's in terms of my ability to connect with people and network with people and communicate with people were really important things in the beginning of my career and all through my career. So I think um, for, so, so I started as a fundraiser and then went on and became the executive director of an organization. And, and um, then the organizations that I ran um, were larger and I ended up running a large organization in Chicago. And I think, one of the things that was important was this concept of continually educating yourself. Um, I, I went on after I graduated from King's, I went on and did my master's and then did a doctorate. And that kind of continual education as we've heard from the other panelists here has was really important in terms of moving forward with my career and building my skills as, as I moved forward. I've also, um, I've retired now from being a CEO, but for the last uh, 12 years, I've been a part-time faculty member at DePaul University in Chicago. And um, I'm currently working as a consultant, um, working globally on the issue of homelessness. So all of the things that sort of I carried through my career, I'm still using today, even though I'm just working part-time. Thank you. And how, Josephine, how about yourself? Um, well, I'm also really just working part time now. I, um, you mentioned that I, I was an elementary school teacher. So that's kind of as a result of having an English degree, um, I went into teaching. Um, but I actually was not really a good fit for me. And uh, it's something I might talk a bit more about later when, when you ask me about my advice for the students. Um, so right now, really, all I'm doing is working part time, um, as you already mentioned, as the writing tutor at the, the right place, and uh, also as the editor of the Mem Insider. So in a way, it's like I still don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up, um, but I'm getting closer to knowing what that is, which uh, we've already talked about. Um, I want to pursue a career in uh, writing center work. No, it's always interesting to um, see. I mean, you guys all started with the same degree and your career paths have diverged greatly from one another. So that's always interesting to see the different ways that people make use of their, their degree or their, their first part of education. Um, so this is almost kind of, do people even still wanna talk about it? But um, I will just touch on uh, COVID-19 and um, how has that impacted your work life? So. Did any of you have to work from home? Um, do you think that um, any of the changes that have been enacted at your work um, are something that are long-term? What of the positive changes and uh, improvements have you seen from your perspective um, with how we've dealt with this pandemic? 
Um, and let's see, we'll go with, uh, we'll try Melanie first. Why don't you start it off? Okay, that's actually perfect because I ended up staying home all last year doing remote learning because I was high risk and my parents were high risk. So I just stayed home in the house for a year, um, but did I taught art remotely and English remotely. Um, art was tricky. English was actually not too bad um, because with Google, you can see the kids write as, they, as they're typing. So that made it really easy to give instant feedback to the kids. So I really liked that part. Um, the downside was I didn't really get to see anybody. There was no faces on the screen. So you didn't get to make that connection with people and, and it, they're just a name. And so you don't, like you, you talk to the kid but it's not the same as seeing the person and how they react. So that was the, I think the hardest part I had was not having that interaction with the kid face to face. Um, but yeah, I did remote for a year. It was interesting. Um, you really need to know your tech. If you're not a techie person, it's really rough. Um, cause I have some coworkers that are older and they're, they're not, they don't want to adapt to the new platforms. Cause I had to use a new platform that we hadn't been using Brightspace or DTL too well. So I had to learn all that. So it was a little rough at the beginning of last year. Um, but the positive, another positive was that, um, I got to do more digital stuff with the, the art kids. So now I'm integrated and back in, back in the classroom and, but we're still going to do some digital stuff every year because it was, it worked out so well. And uh, Noni, what impact has uh, the COVID-19 had on, on you and the work that you were doing? Um, so I retired just before COVID-19, and the organization that I was running was the backbone organization for Chicago's homeless system, and then COVID hit. And I cannot tell you how happy I was that I had retired, um, because what, what had to happen in Chicago's homeless system um, as COVID was coming on was just so challenging. Um, but as I was retiring, I took a job consulting with the Institute on Global Homelessness. And I thought, what a great idea to take a job with a global organization so I get to fly around the world and consult. And it worked out really well. In the fall of 2019, I was in Australia and I was in Scotland. And then I got back, had, had plans to be going to other uh, destinations for work in the um, spring and of course COVID hit. So all of my work became, you know, work that I did online on Zoom. So how did it affect me? I like being home as well. So it was nice to be home and to be able to work. And I had a good setup to be able to very quickly, um, you know, work from home and, and not be places. But I think what's really hard is losing that interaction with colleagues that you um, that you're so used to, and you losing those opportunities where you just you know meet someone and start a discussion, and it's just you know happens very casually, and just not having those opportunities I think affects everybody who's out of their workplace. Absolutely. And I'm sure if we turn the mics to the, the students, they would have some, some similar um, you know, missing the, the, the actual interaction. But Josephine, how about yourself? Uh, well, to be honest with you, um, it's worked out really well for introverts. I found, mm -hmm. I have found, okay. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I was working at the right place as a writing tutor, face-to-face, uh, -face, in person. So at that point, we went uh, completely on, online with our tutoring, and we're still able to provide full services that way. Um, and I actually grew to realize uh, the value of online education in the sense that it, it, um, it has the potential to expand uh, accessibility, I think, and effectiveness just in terms of you know, people not having to travel. Uh, we actually found at the right place, um, the first year of the pandemic, um, our numbers actually rose, the number of our users actually rose and they rose, especially in the winter time. And I think that's down to simply a matter of people did not have to go out in the cold to get to us. So when there was that advantage of being, you know, be able to work from the comfort of your own home um, for us and for the students as well. Uh, and actually for myself, I feel uh, that I'm a better educator working online. 
And the reason for that is because of being an introverted person. So I referred a little bit earlier to how uh, being an elementary school teacher was not a great fit for me. And the reason it wasn't is because you have to be extremely extroverted to be especially uh, an elementary school teacher. So you're like, you're on all the time, like you're a performer. And, you know, I, I did that for a lot of years and I did it, but it was extremely exhausting because it, it just didn't suit my personality. And I spent all those years kind of beating myself up feeling I'm a terrible teacher. I must be like really bad at this because I come home every night feeling like I've been hit by a truck. Uh, and it's only now that I've come to realize it's not about, it's not that I wasn't a good teacher. It's just that that format was really challenging for me. Uh, so I'm actually, I'm really enjoying working from home um, and working online. And also with tutoring at the right place, working one-on-one -on -one is a great bonus for me. Um, that's where I really thrive in that sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship with a student as opposed to 25 five-year-olds all day, every day. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want to say that COVID is a great thing, but um, I, I, I do see that, I, I, I do see sort of a lot of good has come out of having to, to, to work online. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about COVID. Yeah, <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, and Merrick, how about yourself? I think you're, you might have to cut me off if I'm going too long. So I do work in healthcare. I work at London Health Sciences Center, which is Victoria Hospital, University Hospital, and a number of community clinics. So as you guys can probably imagine, my whole world turned upside down. Um, LHSE had the third um, probable COVID-19 patient in January of 2020. And from that day forward, my job switched from looking for fun stories fun things to communicate around the hospital, occasionally being in an operating room with a camera and trying to tell a story within there while someone's operating to really reactive. So 90% of the work we do now is we're reacting to something that either the government has said, something that's happened in the hospital, for instance, outbreaks breaking out, um, our ICUs being full. Um, as I mentioned, government up government updates, we do a lot of posting numbers and giving information to reporters now. So how many people in hospital have COVID? What's their status of COVID? Every week, we join the Middlesex London Health Unit on a weekly media briefing. So we have our spokespeople, how we support them is with speaking remarks that we write Monday morning. We make them up, we listen to a meeting, and then we decide what out of that meeting we wanna share with our community. We, do, we write a Q and A for them, anticipating the questions reporters may have or just doing a media scan over the weekend what were the major media outlets talking about because that's likely what the local ones are going to be interested in from a hospital perspective uh, vaccination we did a lot of promotion about vaccination internally and in partnership with the mlhu um, and sharing those good public health messages which i'll share with you wash your hands wear your mask distance where is appropriate um, and these things became ingrained in our work, but in who we are really um, at the hospital. So from that perspective, the whole industry changed in healthcare. Uh, the way we work has changed, the way we interact with each other has changed. Uh, the other thing that changed is I too work remotely now, which is really interesting because in a creative job, you do miss those interactions. I think Noni mentioned it. Um, just those organic conversations that breed creativity and breed new ideas. So one of the things I have to do is really think about the conversations I'm having and trying to get away from just transactional. So calling someone and saying, we need to talk about this and we need to solve this issue to finding room in that conversation for, how are you doing? Um, with our team, I developed a question of the day. So what's your favorite chocolate bar? And I ask everyone that on a specific day, compare answers, maybe even in a team meeting. And it's as simple as that to just start some natural flowing conversation that doesn't happen as easily as it used to. Absolutely. And just curious, Merrick, would you consider yourself an extrovert or a mix or? In public relations, we tend to be extroverts. So mm -hmm. um, we all did the personality assessment on my team a little while ago. Um, out of 17, we had one person who would identify as an introvert. Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it just no. helps us understand how we relate to each other. 
Um, yeah. and, and there is room for introverts within public relations, but we <laughs> tend to lean a certain way. That's interesting. Um, and finally, um, Noni, we'll let you start this one off. Uh, what advice would you give to current students or recent graduates who are looking to enter your field? Or what do you wish that you had known when you were a student? Well, I've sort of been thinking about it as three things that I think are really important. And this is the information I'd like to share with students today. <clears throat> and I tell this to my own students at DePaul. Um, the first is that nonprofit work is an incredible opportunity to really be able to combine your talent, skills, and experiences with a, a true commitment to community. And for me, community was always very important. And I always felt I had a responsibility to try to make any community I was living in better than it was. And so um, nonprofit work is a great opportunity to do that. I think that nonprofit work provides incredible opportunities for women, much more than the corporate world. I think the, the glass ceiling is very different in nonprofit work than it is in corporate work. And um, when I would look around at my own peers, um, I would see many women leading orga organizations much more than you would ever see in the corporate world. So I think there's great opportunity for women to move to the top much more quickly and easily than there is in the corporate world. The other thing that's really been happening over the years is the nonprofit world or the nonprofit sector has becoming is becoming much more professional. And you can see that now even with the opportunity to get master's degrees in nonprofit um, management. Those didn't exist when I started out in nonprofit work over 30 years ago, but now um, most universities provide an opportunity to get um, graduate level education in nonprofit work. So my first message is nonprofit work is a, is a great uh, place for people to land and um, spend a lifetime. Secondly, and I think again, we've heard this from everybody here, it's critically important that in anything that you do that you keep learning throughout your lifetime. And that can look in a whole variety of different ways, but um, what I always think is if that you need to continually be moving forward and be um, enhancing and building your own skill set. And if you're not moving forward, you're standing still. And if you're standing still, you're moving backwards and somebody else is going to move forward in front of you. So building your skills over your lifetime is really critically important to any sector that you end up working in. And the third thing that I wanted to say is I mentioned that I used to do, and I still do, volunteer work, but volunteer work can be a great avenue to employment. And so if there is something that you're interested in doing, um, volunteering at an organization in that area where you can build and develop skills and develop some experience, not only helps you in terms of when you're looking for a job, but the other thing that it does, and this is critical, is it builds your network. And um, I think if you look at the research around employment, there is a, a, a huge number of people who gain employment through an already existing network. And if you know somebody, you're much more likely to get an interview somewhere and it's getting that interview that's going to get you hired. So you, you have a great opportunity to build and develop your network and then use that network when you're looking for employment. Well, thank you. That was great advice, I think. Um, Josephine, anything you'd like to add along those lines? Um, so what I want to say to the students is um, to realize how for fortunate you are to have uh, what's happening today, okay? The support um, for, your, for your career support and your career guidance. Uh, for some reason, I missed out on all that, and I don't know if it's because it didn't exist or I was just out of the loop, but um, I sort of referred earlier to uh, having an English degree and, and thinking that the only thing I could do was to go into teaching, and that's why I went into teaching. I don't remember there being any kind of career support or guidance offered to me. Maybe it's my fault. Um, 
but I just want you want the students to appreciate um, how fortunate they are to have this. Um, uh, like I said, I went into to teaching because I didn't know what else I could do with an English degree. And also I was under a lot of pressure to hurry up and figure out what I was gonna do to support myself. And uh, just to give you a bit of a sob story, uh, that pressure came from my family. They had no understanding or appreciation of what is the value of a university education. It's actually kind of a miracle that I went to university at all. And I wish that in those days I'd known about writing center work because that would have saved me a lot of frustration in my career, which I've already um, alluded to. So my advice to you is to take full advantage of all the support King's offers in terms of career support. Explore possibilities as much as possible. You may or may not be under the kind of pressure that I was, but if you are, my advice is to not cave under it like I did. Uh, and don't give in to any pressure that you may be under and just take the time to figure out what is really right for you. Thank you. Um, you're right, Kurt, we do have a lot of career services available here at King's. Um, and I'll just do a little plug as well uh, for any students who would be interested um, in a mentor, we do have a program through the alumni office. So you can put in, you can sign up online, just do a search on the website. We have a number of uh, alumni in all different fields who have said, yes, I would be a mentor. And we can connect you with someone who is in a field that you are interested in. And you can have a couple of conversations with that person um, and ask them what it's really like and any advice for them. So. Students who have done that um, have gotten a lot out of the program. So again, you can sign up right on the website and we can try to connect you to someone, um, one of our, our great alumni volunteers. Um, so Merrick, any um, advice that you would give? Sure, so I'll give some of you some practical advice first uh, with my social media hat. Clean up your social media, guys, um, especially those of you in fourth year who are about to apply to either graduate programs, postgraduate degrees, or are going to start looking for jobs in the workforce. Be aware of what you've posted in the last four years. Uh, I'm from the class Facebook started when we were in school, so we were posting all sorts of stuff we shouldn't have been. It was only for people with university uh, email addresses that could get on there. Um, so just take some time, look through your socials and continue to prune them and keep them up. And on that, know what your personal brand is and what you're interested in. As you get um, more into your career, you might wanna focus on being a thought leader or, or sharing some wisdom that you're going to acquire within your career. Uh, the second thing, if you're interested in the career I'm in, you'll need to be a pretty news aware person. So mainstream media is still worth reading. It's still worth consuming. And I encourage you guys to do that thoughtfully. Um, and actually, I encourage you to consume any content online very thoughtfully, recognizing where it's sourced from. And I know that your English degree is teaching you to do that. And then when I was at King, something that was often mentioned, but I didn't absorb um, then was the word mission. So King's has a mission and that came to me at a different point in my career. And that was when I had been a consultant for about five or six years and I was starting to think about leadership and wanting to become a leader within my department, within my team and just generally as a person. And I thought of what's important to me. And for me, it was refugee issues. So I am currently chair of the Cross-Cultural Learner Center. I started on that board as secretary. So really just taking notes at the meetings, learning everything I could. And again, using, the, using that skill of listening, writing and reading um, and being of value to that non nonprofit organization. And over time, I started contributing more, becoming a greater leader on that board, which then allowed me to um, become a leader within London Health Sciences Center and a formal leader. So I used those skills. Um, helped the community, helped myself. Um, and, th and then the second part of that is networking. Um, if you know what career you're going to go in, find somebody to talk to. Uh, I guarantee you professionals are really happy to have a coffee talk about themselves and talk about their passion. I hope it's coming through how much I enjoy my job. So if somebody is interested, I am going to definitely give an hour of my time um, to tell you how great it is because it truly is. That's great, thank you. Thank you all for that um, advice. And um, I think I would be remiss because we've got, you know, we've got a 
a class full of English majors here. You all have the English background. This is your opportunity. If you want to throw out a personal book recommendation, because you've got a bit of a captive audience here of somewhat uh, English nerds, we'll say. So what would be your personal, um, your personal pick for one of your favorite books that you'd like to throw out? Here's your opportunity. So I'll open it to anyone who wants to jump in. Melanie, you said you love to push books on people. <laughs> oh, I, I thought maybe you were maybe, maybe, maybe the students. Um, a book I taught last year in remote I loved was David Cheriandi's Brother. Um, the kids were mad at me because it made it made them cry, but it was a really, really good book and we all really enjoyed it. And it's 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 a quick read, um, but it it was really good. I don't want to give anything away. It's about two young brothers growing up in Scarborough. Um, their mom's an immigrant and just trying to work hard. Um, and dealing with all the issues, like all the racism, um, and yeah, and getting teary-eyed thinking about it, but it was really, really good. I read that this year too, and yes, great pick. Anyone else? Noni? Well, I think since we own the Village Bookshop in Bayfield, I should, <laughs> I should say something. I think you should um, pick one, yes. <laughs> well, I can't really pick one. This is the problem, <laughs> that I can't just pick one book because um, there are so many books that are incredible and that can change your life. And um, but what I'm going to talk about right now, I think, is <laughs> is a good opportunity for people that every year CBC has uh, a um, event called Canada Reads and five finalist books are picked. And those books um, all speak to Canada in a different and meaningful way. And they're incredibly diverse and they really, um, they're, they're, I think, really important books for Canadian culture and Canadian thinking. And so there are five books this year in Canada Reads. I'm not going to say what they are, but you can find them by going to CBC Canada Reads 2022. We in Bayfield do a Bayfield Reads as well, and we have um, defenders and judges, and we will pick the winner of Bayfield Reads the, just at the beginning of the week of the final week of Canada Reads, which is the 27th of March this year. But if you're looking for some great books that are really going to make you think about your own identity and the identity of Canada, I would suggest that you look at the Canada Reads books. Okay. Merrick, how about you? What would you recommend? So I'm not going to re recommend it for you guys until the summer, but it's called Malazan Book of the Fallen by a Canadian author named Stephen Erickson. It is a huge dense fantasy series. Okay. I'm currently reading Wheel of Time and then on a more professional level, Team of Teams is a, a great story and it's really how America shifted the war um, specifically in Afghanistan and how they adapted to a new type of um, enemy and response that the they needed, they needed to respond to. And Josephine, do you have a pick for us? Um, well, I always love, I love um, authors who fictionalize history in brilliant ways. Um, so one of my favorite books is The Terror. It's by Dan Simmons, and he's fictionalized uh, the Franklin Expedition. And actually there's a bit of a Canadian tie in there because you know how those ships were found in uh, the Northwest Passage. Those ships were actually discovered, the wrecks were discovered quite recently. Okay. Um, so I don't know, it's just, it's, it's just a very, very uh, absorbing and very fun read, uh, The Terror. And there's all, there was also a, a series, uh, a, a television series was also made that was based on the book and it was just one of my favorite things. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, so, Paul, we will turn it over now. Um, are there any questions out there that the students have for any of our panelists? I do have a write-in one here, so maybe I'll start with that while people are, are maybe coming up with ideas. Um, I guess this is around, do you feel, did you feel stressed about your career as you started approaching graduation? Um, if, 
if students are currently coming up to that and panicking because they don't know exactly what they want to do, any recommendations for is that normal and how they would handle that that stress and that those panic feelings like you've got to have it all figured out as soon as you graduate. Melanie? Um, so having an English and history degree, the question I always got was, oh, so you're going to be a teacher. And I totally resisted that for most of my undergrad because I'm like, like, no, no, no. And then in my fourth year, I started volunteering at the library and helping a little, doing a little buddy reading. And then that's when I kind of realized, oh, maybe this is something I would like. Um, I was crazy. I only applied to Althouse and I only applied to the Master Library of Informational Science at Western. That, I didn't apply to any other school. I put all my eggs in one basket and I was crazy, but it worked. I got into both. <laughs> so I went to teacher's college first, but it was always, I had, I could go back to master's in library school. I didn't have to stick with it. And then when I was in teacher's college, I discovered when well, you can take library through teacher's college. So you're never really stuck. So even if you make a choice and you're like, eh, you can always change it. You're not, you're not stuck in that route. And my, a friend of mine who I met in teacher's college, she totally left the profession and does something completely different. She's an executive director of the Waterloo County Training Board. Um, so uses her English degree every day, writing grant proposals and writing up reports and stuff, but not, not teaching, but still, she's got a much more interesting job than I do, I think, sometimes. <laughs> anyone else? Um, anyone else want to jump in? I was going to say, it's never helpful to feel stress about something. And there are so many jobs that are open right now that even if you don't get a job where you want it, there are lots of things that you can do just to earn some money while you're looking for that job. Um, but I think it's really important to think about what are the things that you really enjoy and what are the things you like to do and how can you make that a job? So like Jos Josephine, um, I thought about teaching, but I didn't actually go into it um, because I started volunteering as a as a teaching assistant for elementary school. And I, I realized very quickly <laughs> that I was not going to be a good teacher because I just didn't have patience. I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't do what was needed of me in that um, situation. So even though I was um, graduating with a degree in English and so many people were going into teaching at the time, I realized that it wasn't the right thing for me. But I think there, you, you don't have to feel stressed because your first job is not going to be your last job. And it's, it might be a journey to get where you need to go. But if you're open to that journey um, and that you're, you know, that you continue to move forward, you will get where you need to go. For me, I had no idea what public relations was um, until I actually applied for the program. And that's kind of that quote, um, success is where preparation meets opportunity. I was unknowingly preparing myself through my English degree. And then somebody said, you would be great in this field. You should look it up. I did. And I managed to squeak into a deadline of applying for my postgraduate certificate right away. But my plan was honestly to take things a little easy, work over the summer or over the year and figure out exactly what I wanted to do. I thought I would go into a master's program of some sort. I just needed time to decide what kind. And I ended up going into my current career field and um, kind of finding my place. And I agree. Um, don't stress about it. It will happen for you. Um, my parents always told us that you got to do it for 30 years to so do something you, you'd like to get up in the morning and go to do. So, I mean, money is one thing, but you got to be happy and you got to do something that is challenging and keeps you interested and makes you happy to go to work every day, which I find with teaching is that it's constantly changing and I have a bit of a challenge and I don't get bored. That's great. Um, Paul, we do have one other written um, question, but did you have any other questions um, from the room? What do you think? No, we, we don't seem to appear in questionable form here. Okay, uh, we might so, have some introverts in your room maybe. <laughs> go ahead with your written question, please. Um, okay, so the, the question was, do you have a current employment goal that you're working towards? Um, 
Does anyone want to want to put forth anything that you're you're trying to get to still? Merrick, I bet you've got a, a plan in mind. Well, I actually just became manager about six oh, months ago, so that okay. was my last goal. So yeah. my mind's already starting to think, um, what's the next step for me? That might be actually a master's degree. So I've got my two postgraduate certificates in project management and PR. The project management one was, again, an attempt to get some other business practices under my belt as I develop in my career. The master's um, goal is because eventually I'd like to be a director or executive director within a communication, the communications field. And a master's is often required for, at least at the hospital specifically it is. Um, and I'll probably continue pursuing that within communications, but perhaps public health or something along those lines. Lifelong learning. <laughs> I just Anyone took a course last share? summer. Oh, sorry, ahead. sorry. Go I just ahead. took a course last summer because, like I said, I've been English an English teacher, librarian, and then our art teacher retired, and they couldn't hire someone to replace her. Um, so I'm like, well, I can do it. I'm going to take on the challenge. So I took an art qualification class just with Western this summer online. And so here's the next chapter. <laughs> so, but then the next goal will be retirement. But we won't talk about that. Great. Well, um, we are coming up to the end of the hour. Uh, so Paul, unless you had anything else. No, well, I just wanted to say thank you to, uh, to all of you for uh, taking time out of your lives to, to come back as it were, and to, uh, and to talk to us and to share your experience and your, uh, your advice. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. And yes, thank you from our office as well. Um, we really appreciated your insight and sharing a bit of your story. And thank you for staying connected to, to King. Um, and to, to students, again, if you'd like to, to check out the mentoring or you have any um, follow-up questions, um, please don't hesitate to, to get in contact with the um, alumni office here. And uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>